it's a 23 year old male. Uh, you can see low BMI. It's a Boeing engineer that usually involves a lot of different questions uh, and having to explain everything a little more detailed than the average uh, patient. So pretty active, pretty standard for at least the Seattle area. Uh, so he's had recurrent damage from continuing athletics. It's kind of a two year problem. Uh, he says worse over the last couple of years, he notices swelling with kneeling, pain and popping with any squatting. Um, again, not uh, more of a recurrent injury, no previous surgeries. And really his whole main goal was, I wanna go back to doing these sports that I love and I just can't do them. Uh, next slide. So again, just jumping around. So my concerns of the story, you know, the two years of pain and someone who's pretty young and active is concerning. The popping, but really for me, and it was, you know, the swelling and locking for someone who's young is not normal. Uh, and again, you know, trying other adjuncts, different options, cortisone, hyaluronic acid, PRP, we've chatted about all those things. Um, and then, you know, usually trying physical therapy. And again, he came in having tried those things. And again, worry these symptoms. Again, if this swelling and locking happens, I do worry that sometimes that alone won't treat it, but it's something that still be aware of. And again, uh, most of the time I have my patients at least try it. Um, and you want to be, again, many times the smaller defects are more subtle and they may be completely asymptomatic. So the smaller defects tend to be less symptomatic, the larger ones more. So we start feeling these symptoms you think about as is a larger defect. All right, next slide. Uh, so again, normal standing alignment uh, in terms of the patellofemoral joint, he had no previous instability, no J sign. Uh, I mentioned before this patellar grind popping, no real facet pain. So right here, you're thinking this is a really vague uh, exam finding. And for trochlear defects, they tend to have these very uh, vague exam findings and really always hard to, to pinpoint the direct pain. They usually just kind of point at their knee, at least at the front of the kneecap. So we had a moderate effusion on exam, good range of motion, otherwise everything was stable uh, and no comorbidities. Uh, next slide, please. So again, first thing in the office is x-rays. So he has this very small spur medially, um, relatively good alignment and not seeing a lot of subluxation of the patella. And then, you know, you can see from the uh, PA view as well, no arthritic changes. Uh, next slide. So, you know, going on to MRI, we're gonna kind of speed through this. Uh, the defect here, and these trochlear defects can be really hard to read. I mean, I was able to see a lot of them, but you don't always get to see all those. So reading these MRIs, especially the trochlear ones are more challenging. Um, this one measured roughly about two centimeters. The biggest thing for me is no bone edema. Uh, TTTG, so a little bit off at 13, but nothing majorly abnormal, and CD ratio is roughly one. Um, again, I always, this is something I learned definitely from fellowship, is these defects, while two by two is already pretty large, uh, they're usually bigger when you end up doing something arthroscopically and evaluating it. And don't write off trochlear defects in general, because it's always hard to fully identify them on MRI. Um, next slide. So this is the arthroscopy and Macy biopsy. We knew he was gonna have a pretty large defect. Initially just going in here, uh, just seeing that right there and then seeing the patella on uh, then next slide. And you can see here just from a thorough debridement, I'm not using a curette or anything, just using a small shaver. I'm able to get a much larger rim on there and this defect ended up being pretty large. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, you know, we're not really looking at the meniscus and the other things, but meniscus intact, trochlear defect measured around 2.5 by two centimeters. Uh, the good thing for here is I always double check the patella, probe the entire patella because you have a kissing lesion that changes things um, and you really want to thoroughly evaluate this uh, and no other involvement in any other cartilage. Uh, next slide. So surgical plan for me with seeing a defect like this without bone edema, uh, I think this warrants a Macy. Uh, there's been really good results. These trochlear patients for me tend to do quite well and you don't burn any bridges um, if anything further is needed. Um, Biggest thing to think about is reducing the bleeding at the preparation site and be prepared to put sutures in if needed. But again, with the technique uh, that we have now, you really don't need to do that in majority of cases. Um, Size-wise is important too. You know, important to be prepared if it's greater than 10 centimeters squared or it's two sites greater than, or uh, greater than 14 or greater two sites greater than 10. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have uh, an extra sheet of mason. You can order that pretty easily. And again, in this case, no concomitant procedures, but it's important to be prepared for those if you do have them. Next slide. So this is the end up going on to Macy. Um, this is the debridement uh, of the defect. And then we use the pre-cutting guide and then we're able to place the Macy on there. Um, you can see here, we didn't have to use any sutures for him. Uh, and I'll show you my technique, but again, I run the knee through range of motion after I finish. If there's any concern, then I'll put a suture in. Uh, but in a lot of cases, I don't need to. I tend to do a few more sutures in a patella than I would in a trochlear, 
uh, just because the defects, the way the borders are of the trochlea, especially the thickness of the cartilage, I'm able to get a little better hold and I'm a little bit less concerned about it coming off. So OR tips, newer soak patties, you don't have to seal the fibrin glue. Um, I always start, I start with tourniquet on and then I take the tourniquet down to take care of any bleeders. Um, make sure it's completely dry before starting. Uh, you'll sh I'll show you in the video that we do. And any concerns, you have six ovicro sutures. Uh, and then I run the knee through range of motion because I don't want to leave until I'm sure that defect uh, is going to stay filled throughout the range of motion process because they usually start CPM pretty promptly. Uh, next slide. So this is a very brief video. Uh, so you can see a pre-cutting template. This oval template is usually one of my more commonly used ones. This is a trochlear, not this exact patient. Um, and then they've got these nice curettes, uh, making sure you get a good thorough border. Again, you know, you don't want bleeding of the defect. You want to just go to the calcified cartilage layer um, and making sure you, I have a little like this little hand curette I really like because it really gets around those edges. Uh, and then you can see making sure your assistant doesn't actually smash the Macy. So that's always important. Um, with the smaller ones, it's a little bit easier. You can see the left uh, bottom left hand corner is where the Macy's facing. So rough side up. Uh, and then I use a little uh, top of a uh, specimen cup, put a little bit of the fluid from the Macy, making sure I keep that orientation of rough side up. Um, and then neurosoak patties, the tourniquet at this point is down. So we know we're not gonna develop a hematoma. So in this patient, there was a little bit of bleeding at one of the little small areas. So I put a little to seal or fibrin glue, and then I apply significant pressure. And that usually stops the bleeding. At this point, after this step, I usually haven't had any issues with bleeding. Um, and there are other little tips you can use. And then I put another round of fibrin glue. And then what I'm gonna do is place the rough side down or the shiny side up. And these are the toothless pickups that you use. And then you place that in the defect, just being careful just to really stay on the edges and not damage it. Light finger pressure. I usually do around one minute of finger pressure check to make sure I haven't moved the defect and go to three minutes and then play another round of fibrin glue. And you can see here, I've put it through significant range of motion. It didn't move at all. So I don't need any stitches. All right, next slide. So brace for six weeks, CPM, I usually set that pretty aggressively. I try to get in range of motion as fast as possible without damaging the defect. Obviously, if there's a TTO or something else, we go a little bit slower. Uh, really weight bearing is tolerated with straight leg raise are in uh, locked in extension on when they're weight bearing weight, range of motion, again, goal is zero to 90 first two weeks. Stairs are avoided for the first six months, no real squats for 12 weeks. Uh, and this, most of this stuff is from the Macy website. Post-op status, so he returned in nine months to all sports. He's, it was incredibly happy. Um, and uh, he went back to basketball, et cetera. No full range of motion, no further swelling. So he was happy with his result. So at zero to three months, you know, you're, you can see where the implant's at. So when you're telling people to do certain physical therapy regimens, it's important to know that, you know, even at three to six months, this is not fully grown back. And so it's something to understand that, you know, you're not fully remodeled till that six to nine. And so it's important to understand that they're still gaining, they're still gaining the strength and gaining those things. And when you're seeing these patients at the interval uh, follow-ups that, you know, it, it, they're not going to be immediately better in the first few weeks. It takes a while for the Macy to grow back and it's very effective, but you just have to be patient and understand why you can't do those heavy squatting until six months. Macy. Autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of Macy administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimeter squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use. Effectiveness of Macy in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of Macy in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. Macy is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other aminoglycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. Macy is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. Macy is also not indicated for use in patients 
who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months, excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a Macy implant. Macy is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of Macy in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with Macy are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and Macy implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the Macy product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of Macy. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The Macy implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of Macy in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for Macy greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for Macy were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.